The Dateable Podcast is an insider's look into modern dating that the Huffington Post calls one of the top 10 podcasts about love and sex. On each episode, we'll talk to real daters about everything from sex parties to sex droughts, date fails to diaper fetishes, and first moves to first loves. I'm your host, Yue Xu, former dating coach turned dating sociologist. You'll also hear from my co-host and producer, Julie Kraftchik, as we explore this crazy dateable world. Welcome to season 13, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Dateable Podcast, where we are on a mission to dig (laughs) into the whys of people's behavior when it comes to modern dating. And we've been on this mission for 13 freaking seasons. I can't even believe it. Lucky 13, here we are. And we have a treat for all of you today. We are digging into the whys when it comes to sex. And you guys have asked for it. You asked for more sex, and we're giving you more sex. We're giving it to you, because we're a sex podcast after all. You don't know, but sex sex falls into the whole scheme of things. I feel like you can't have dating without sex. You can't have relationships without sex. And we're going to go into all of that with... I almost want to feel like she's like the godfather of sex or like the godmother of sex, I guess is the, you know, I feel like when you hear about sex books, Come As You Are is one that people always reference. And we were super lucky that we're part of the Frolic Media Network, which you probably have heard us talk about many of times on our podcast and the author of come as you are is also part of the network so we obviously jumped at the chance to try to get her as a guest and here she is for our season opener emily nagoski is her name she i feel like she could be a household name by now she (laughs) is though i feel like she's responsible for opening up the conversation about sex and what's normal when it comes to sex and this is one of those books that to me was so eye-opening because it wasn't about ooh, how to have the best sex of your life or what you're doing wrong. It was like how to just accept how your sex life is right now and how, how to better understand how your body works when it comes to mm-hmm. intimacy, stimulation, um, the, the things that turn you on and things that turn you off. It is absolutely probably the most most beneficial book for your sex life to read today, whether you're a man or a woman. Yep. Whatever your sexuality, whatever your age is, stage of life. I thought it was completely eye opening. I'm like, I can't even believe I like hadn't read it until recently. Like, I kind of feel like I should have like from a long time ago. Was this your first time reading it also, UA? Or had you read it? It was my first time. I had heard I had heard about it for years, but she did update the book this year. So I'm actually glad that I read it this year. (laughs) And I have an excerpt from the book that I think really sums up her message. If I may, Julie, yes, can I? hit it. The media message. You are inadequate. Spanking, food play, menage a trois. You've done all those things, right? Well, you've at least had clitoral orgasms, vaginal orgasms, uterine orgasms, energy orgasms, extended orgasms, and multiple orgasms. And you've mastered at least 35 different positions for intercourse. If you don't try all these things, you're frigid. If you've had too few partners, don't watch porn, and don't have a collection of vibrators in your bedside table, you're a prude. Also, you're too fat and too thin. Your breasts are too big and too small. Your body is wrong. If you're not trying to change it, you're lazy. If you're satisfied with yourself as you are, You're settling. And if you dare to actively like yourself, you're a conceited bitch. In short, you are doing it wrong. Do it differently. No, that's wrong, too. Try something else. Forever. Yeah, take that in. (laughs) I mean, I feel like that does sum it up well, because this whole, like, you are normal is such the message that she's bringing in. And I don't know, I feel like you're like constantly learning new things about sex. Like even we're both like, I'm still in my late 30s, but almost in my 40s. And, you know, you would think that you would like have it all figured out by now. But I feel like it's always something that you're learning new things. Like the education of sex never ends, probably because we had such horrible sex education growing up. 
<laughs> sex education is such a misnomer because I learn nothing no. about sex. I only learn about contraception <laughs> and I only learn about diseases and STIs. Yeah, it's all like fair tactics. You know, I was like having a conversation with a guy friend and he was saying how one of the topics that no one ever talks about is how women's like vaginas are all different. Like, you know how like mm. in society, everyone's always talking about like dick size all the time, like width and girth and length and all the stuff but no one ever talks about vaginas being different and i i feel like what emily is saying here too and we talk about in the episode is there is no normal like i think like everyone thinks that if they're not doing something a certain way that something's wrong per se and i think with Mm -hmm. a quote you said like the media message of what sex is and what we learned in sex education that kind of drills home normal and she's basically saying Mm -hmm. like throw that all away yeah i think one of my major learnings in even being in my 40s now is this idea of frequency. Yeah. I used to judge my sex life on how often I was having sex. And I realized that's not a really great gauge for your sex life because it's sort of quantity over quality. You could be having a lot of bad sex. That does not mean you're having a great sex life. And I used to judge my partners based on that. And mm. I was I would get I would get scared, you know, three months into a relationship. Does your sex die down a little bit? Are you having less sex? But ultimately, it's all it all comes back to intimacy and connection. And we place so much pressure on the quantity of sex that we forget to place importance on the quality of connection with your partner. Mm -hmm. That is so true. And I mean, we go into it all in this episode. But I think one of the things that stuck out for me the most is over time how things change too Mm -hmm. and like I haven't been in like a five plus year relationship before or like a 20 year relationship Mm -hmm. like having kids like all the stuff that like you know does or just going through stress like we talk a lot about stress and like how does that impact your sex life and I think like this really opened my eyes up that you know like if things kind of can go in waves like it doesn't Mm -hmm. mean that there's something necessarily wrong with the relationship and like we've heard before like people are like oh sex is a barometer for how the relationship is doing and I think like on some sense that's correct like it can't be like you know non-existent or like right that one person isn't satisfied at all but I do think there is external stuff that really has nothing to do with the relationship or just where you're both at at the time like if you have like a sick parent like how are you gonna feel like sexy you know like that doesn't have to do with your relationship yeah their life happens and then how are you really supposed to keep maintain the same yeah. sort of sexual desires as you evolve as a person. And I think that's the ultimate message is that as we evolve ourselves, our sex lives will evolve. And that's something really exciting. It's not something that we should look down upon at all. No. And I think like I remember talking to a friend about this and like she was talking about just how her sex life was not good with her partner. And I'm like, have you talked to him about it? Mm -hmm. And she's like, I can't. And I feel like there's this feeling of like not like it feels like this like super personal topic that no one wants to rock the boat on. But ultimately, it was causing a lot of like dissatisfaction in the relationship. And I think like you're worried that you're going to offend someone. But at the same time, like if you're just like not communicating about it and it's obvious that you're not having sex like, that's not good either. <laughs> you know, like, people aren't just going to be like, oh, we haven't had sex in six months. Everything's great. You know, like, there's clearly there's unspoken stuff there, too. Remember that woman I met years ago after an event and she told me she hadn't had sex with her boyfriend for like over four years? Yeah. And she said they're very close, but that's just one topic they can't they can't talk about. And I was just floored for four years. You're not having sex with each other and you can't talk about it. Right. That's not that's like beyond sex. That's something else. That's a deeper issue there. Totally. But like, why are we so afraid to talk about it? So afraid. And I think it. Yeah. Yeah, like I think like we go into this and I mean there are times that the sex isn't gonna line up in a relationship and I think that's really hard and I I personally haven't been there enough to, to give super solid advice 
on it. But I can only imagine that that is so challenging. Like if you're just not on the same page as your partner when it comes to sex, like if everything else is great in the relationship, and that's like the one area that isn't. And I'm really glad we had this conversation with Emily because I feel like the way I might have approached that topic was like the counter of what she did. So I thought it was really helpful to hear about that from an expert. And I'm sure many of you, like if you're going through this now, you've gone through it in the past, or even if your sex life is fantastic with your partner, I think for me personally, being aware of it is really good to get ahead of it. So if things do happen, you're like, okay, I know how I know some ways that I could handle this. And know that your sex life is going to be different than other people's. So we cannot be keeping up with the Joneses when it comes to sex lives. I feel like in the past, I would talk to friends about it and they'd be like, oh, my God, my boyfriend and I are having sex like five, five days a week. And it would put so much pressure on me or they're like, oh, we've been having a lot of public sex. And I'm like, oh, my God, now I got to find like a public (laughs) area to have sex in just so I can feel like I'm also a little sexy kitten. But if that's not the way to evaluate your own, because you're 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 the only person you and your partner are the only ones in your relationship or in your sexual um couple coupling and you can't, other people can't judge it and you can't judge other people's either They're totally and that's why I like the whole size thing i mean for men and now we're talking about for women also or people <laughs> yeah. who identify as women and i think it like ultimately doesn't matter it's like as long as it's working for you it's all about like the fit together i think yes and that's very much related to our question. Julie, unless if you have anything else, I can go into no, the question. No, let's do it. Let's get those questions. We love sex questions when they come in. <laughs> this one is a very popular question, and it is a, the billion-dollar question, I'm mm. going to call it. How do I get better at sex? We've had many different ways of people asking us this question. And it goes back to our conversation already where everybody's different. So there's no blanket statement on how to get better at sex. The first thing I can think of is to get to know your partner the best you possibly Mm -hmm. can. Talk to them, communicate, ask what turns them on, what turns them off. What is something that you've done that they really loved? What is something that they think you can improve on? It's that constant feedback loop that... That will help you improve your sex life with the person that you're having sex with. <laughs> Julie and I sitting here cannot tell you how to have the best sex of your life, but we can tell you how to have really good sex with us. <laughs> <laughs> I think, though, that also a piece of it is that like kind of what you were just saying of you feel this pressure to be like the sex kitted, right? And like to mm-hmm. do performative and to try all the positions and do all this. I personally think it comes down to enthusiasm and, mm. you know, just having fun at the end of the day. Like that's what makes good sex when both partners are just really freaking excited to be there and present. I mm-hmm. think like and I mean, we'll go into all of it but it's like if one person is not in the mood or in that place and the other is that's when there's a lot of tension I think when we can find those times when both people are like you know ready to go do this and having a good time I think like and even inviting laughter into the bedroom like things that like you would never see in the movies I feel like anything you see in the movies throw out and you know please like especially sex life that tv show like it was like the most unrealistic portrayal of sex I've ever seen in my life oh, especially during covid yes i cannot watch some th- those scenes knowing covid's out there like wait sanitize like the train track ones are you looking yeah. to die like i'm sorry yeah. <laughs> like what <laughs> yeah my basic needs aren't being met so please take it out of my vagina <laughs> i'm trying to survive here so i think though just like you know bringing that lightheartedness to it i think it's all about the vibe and energy and connection that you're having and like you i said to just having those conversations the only way is through communication there's a common misconception that the more partner sexual partners you you've had, the better you are at sex. And I can tell you that is absolutely not true. Yeah. The best sex I've had before my current partner was with someone who had only been with one person his whole life. And the reason why our sex was so good was that he was so great at communication and so great at being attentive to my needs. Mm -hmm. And it had nothing to do with him having multiple partners. He's only been with one other person before me. I absolutely second that because I think sex 
between two people is different. Like mm-hmm. it doesn't, how do you know, like if you love being in a relationship versus like a relationship with the other person? Mm. And I think sex is the same thing too. It's like, do you love sex or sex with that person? And mm. I almost think like, obviously everyone's going to be like, I love sex in general, or I love being in a relationship because I like being with the person. But I think it almost is one in the same. Mine is just the pure fact of doing it versus not because you're in a relationship with that other person and then your relationship with another person would look totally different. And I think the same Mm -hmm. goes for sex. It's like you and that person are having a sexual relationship and that looks totally different than if they were to have that with someone else. So if you look at it that way, it really doesn't matter how many partners they've had because what you guys have is unique at the end of the Mm -hmm. day. Yep. Yep. And every new person you have sex with, treat it like it's something so new and fresh. And so we're we're talking about people who are in relationships. But even if you are having one night stands or having these short term situationships, how can you get better at sex? Again, it's having the intentions of having fun, keeping it uh, in the present Mm -hmm. stop pressuring yourself stop thinking about oh i have to orgasm or she has to orgasm or he has to orgasm don't think about the end product just have fun in the moment and experiment and have that constant feedback loop and you should be good you should be good to go (laughs) right presence is everything with all aspects of relationships (laughs) fabulous announcements yeah let's do a few announcements um you've all heard it before but we have the new sounding board 2.0 that we are kickstarting next month officially so if you are interested in joining the sounding board definitely get in now we've seen a lot of new people rolling through which is awesome you will lock in our legacy rate so we are now going to move to one tier you will lock in the legacy rate we will be upping this rate come September. So definitely get in now if you've been thinking about it. In 2.0, you're going to have the opportunity to talk to UA and I doing these like coffee chats slash office hours. We're still working on the full name. But basically, it's an opportunity to ask us anything about your dating lives and to just shoot the shit and talk to us in a group setting. And also, you know, it's that mastermind with other folks too. So you might get a really you might get a answer from us, but you also might get a really great answer from another person to whatever you're going through. And we are also rolling out like a more you know focused discussions we've learned from um sounding board 1.0 that people really love coming when there's a specific topic that's super relevant Mm -hmm. and they get this opportunity to chat to chat with other folks hear different perspectives and that's exactly what we're going to be doing so we're going to have our hosts be leading these amazing discussions that it's like you're kind of like doing your own mini podcast with these people but it's not recorded (laughs) for the public which is kind of the best of both worlds here so (laughs) yes because that would be illegal so we wouldn't be doing that but we are experimenting with sounding board in its truest form it's called the sounding board for a reason and this is a safe space for you to come to and get pretty much crowdsource opinions and advice from other people who may be going through the same things or have been through them t- before. So get all the information at datablepodcast.com slash sounding board. You can also DM us on Instagram at Datable Podcast because we're pretty active there and we can answer any questions you may have. But it is something that I, I think it's part of personal self-care and you mm-hmm. deserve it. So treat yourself. Absolutely. And then of course, follow us on Instagram at Datable Podcast. That is our other active social channel, especially with season 13 rolling out. We're going to have great clips from some of our guests, uh, some teasers of what's to come. And of course, you know, there was this one quote that we put up this week that I feel like got so much fucking love. Yes. Oh my God. People were like sharing this left and right. I've never seen anything we put up get this many shares. <laughs> it was basically, I'll read it. It was me. I don't want to go on this date. Also me, but maybe he's the one. Narrator, he wasn't the one. <laughs> he wasn't the one. <laughs> that was a better narrator was, voice. <laughs> the one is right around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> I know. If if only we could have voices following us around, narrating our lives. Exactly. How fascinating would that be? <laughs> exactly. But I think, yeah, it will give you, you know, your daily inspiration, your daily laugh, whatever you want to take away from it. <laughs> <laughs> whatever you want to call it. And just your daily support system. How about we call it that? Your daily support. 
support that. system. Yes. Sometimes you got to just laugh when shit's hitting the fan, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. You got people rooting for you with the best memes and quotes on the interwebs, <laughs> <laughs> folks. Okay, let's hear it now from our sponsor this week. This episode is made possible by Thrive Cosmetics. You've heard us rave about them before, and we're not stopping. Thrive Cosmetics is a line of high-performance, award-winning products that are made with clean, high-performance, skin-loving ingredients. All Thrive Cosmetics products are formulated without toxic ingredients like parabens, sulfates, and phthalates, and they're cruelty-free by never testing on animals. The Liquid Lash Extensions Mask mascara is my number one obsession. I no longer have to get extensions because this magical mascara does the trick. It's completely flake-free, smudge-free, and clump-free and stays on even on the hottest of days. No raccoon eyes for me. Also, as part of their Bigger Than Beauty mission, for every product purchased, Thrive Cosmetics support nonprofit partners with a donation of funds or products. I am truly inspired by how this is a beauty brand that goes beyond skin deep. You're going to love them as much as we do. Visit thrivecosmetics.com slash dateable for 15% off your first order. This is an exclusive offer you can only get here. That's thrive, C-A-U-S-E, medics.com slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E for 15% off your first order. Again, thrivecosmetics.com slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. It is no surprise Julie and I are huge fans of therapy, especially online therapy, and BetterHelp can do exactly just that. They match you with your own licensed therapist and connect you in a safe and private online environment. I was able to start communicating with my therapist in less than 48 hours hours super fast. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, and it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling. Their licensed professionals specialize in everything from stress management, uh, anxiety, trauma, dating, and grief. We at Dateable wish for all of you to live a happier, more wholesome life, and we think therapy and prioritizing your mental health will accomplish that. So as our listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash dateable. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E. Okay, let's get into it with Emily. Emily Nagoski. You've heard her name over and over again. I've had so many friends recommend your book to me, Come As You Are, and also your other book, Burnout, that you wrote with your sister, also another fabulous book. We are so incredibly honored to have you with us today. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know who Emily Nagoski is, she's in her 40s. She currently lives in Massachusetts. She's been there for 12 years, originally from Delaware. She is married, and she's the author of the book, Come As You Are, The Surprising New Science that will transform your sex life. Hi, Emily. Hello. And there she is. We're so excited to have you, Emily. I feel like I feel like your book is just kind of like a rite of passage. Like, and you said the first version was released in 2015. Is that right. correct? Yeah. And then you updated again for 2021. What were some of the changes in the 2021 version? Some of it is detailed stuff, making sure the science was still as up to date as it could possibly be. The science is, matters a lot to me, uh, having it be as evidence based as possible. But some of it was pretty large scale shift. So maybe the largest change was to the desire chapter, chapter seven. So mm. the core idea in that chapter is that most of us, by the time we get to adulthood, we have this story in our head of how sexual desire is supposed to work. And that narrative is something like spontaneous desire, where you're just like walking down the street and you suddenly out of the blue, all of a sudden are just like, oh, I would I would like to have some sex. How about? And you go to your partner like, I would <laughs> like to have the sex. How about that? And that's spontaneous desire. It appears in anticipation of pleasure, essentially. Yes, that is a normal, healthy way to experience sexual desire. Absolutely. Nothing wrong with that. And there's also another normal, healthy way to experience desire, which is responsive desire, where hmm. uh, instead of it just like trucking down the street and you like it suddenly just occurs to you, oh, sex is a good <laughs> idea. You might be like just like sitting on the couch, flipping through Netflix, having chosen something to watch and you're certain special someone is sitting next to you and starts just like touching you in a really lovely way. Mm. And that 
that sensation goes up to your brain and is like, so this is happening. And your brain's like, that's really nice. And then like a little bit more keeps happening and that sensation goes up to your brain and the sensation's like, so so this is happening. What do you think? And your brain's like, yeah, yeah, that's really nice. And maybe you turn towards your partner and you start like doing some kissing on them. And uh, then your brain says, so this sensation is happening. What do you think? And your whole self is like, you know what? How about this sexy time? How about we get some sex? How about that? It emerges. <laughs> How about we do it? Let's do the dirty. <laughs> it's, it's called responsive desire because it emerges in response to pleasure, mm. where spontaneous desire emerges in anticipation of pleasure. And it's news to a lot of people that responsive desire is 100% normal, natural, healthy. In fact, the couples who sustain strong connections over the long term, regardless of their relationship structure, whether they're like monogamous married or poly married or open relationship, uh, this is their only like long-term sexual relationship. They have, they, they come and go in this relationship. If you want to sustain a strong sexual connection with another person over the long term, it is not going to be a relationship characterized primarily by spontaneous desire. That is mm. not what the research shows. The research is unambiguous that couples who sustain a long sexual, long-term sexual connection with each other, primarily that relationship is characterized by responsive desire. In the first version of Come As You Are, I said, so uh, responsive desire is normal too. Uh, but I know everybody hears that and is like, well, it's all well and good that it's normal, but let's face it, spontaneous desire is better. <laughs> so the first version of Come As You Are is here's some strategies to get to spontaneous desire if that really matters for you. And the more research accumulated over the following years, the more I was like, no, people need to let go of spontaneous mm. desire because it truly, deeply does not matter. And their pursuit of spontaneous desire is actually interfering with their ability to have very pleasurable sex. Pleasure is the central defining characteristic of great sexual connections. It is not how much you can't wait to put your tongue in the other person's mouth. It is how much you enjoy it when you mm. do put your tongue in the other person's mouth. So I switched the entire function of that chapter to being like, not only is responsive desire normal, it is the thing that you should be focusing on. This is so fast. I'm so glad we're starting here because I think it's important to define what these two desires mean. Because in my head, when I read this chapter, I kept thinking, you know, one of the complaints that my partner has is that I don't initiate. I'm, I respond. Mm. And I love being like, you talk about contextual when all my ducks in a row, I feel good. And he initiates that's when I get really turned on. So for someone who, you know, I very much focus on the responsive desire, but someone still has to initiate that chain of events, right? And isn't that, wouldn't that be part of the spontaneous desire? Maybe. Or, so the complicating factor in the picture that I have seen you painting here is that feeling wanted is a big part of what puts you in a desirous state of mind. It's part of what arouses you. You're like, everything's going great, the context is positive, and then your partner approaches you in a way that feels really good. And like, that's the thing that kicks you over to the edge until like, oh, right, yeah, this person wants me. Yeah, uh -huh. all right. And probably your partner would really like it if you initiated because because they also like to feel wanted. For sure. And initiation often makes it feel like this person wants me. And like you do <laughs> want your partner, right? Like you enjoy the sex that you have together. Absolutely. So you don't have to have a spontaneous kind of like horny bones feeling in order to initiate sex. So let's go into that a little more. I want to talk about what dictates our sexual response because you have a lot of interesting research about yeah. just like how long do we have all day? <laughs> <laughs> what wants basically what makes us want to like pump the brakes versus like put the gas pedal on? Can you kind of right. go into that a little yeah. more? So uh, what you're talking about there is the good old dual control model, which is the mechanism mm -hmm. in your brain that controls sexual response. Um, and as you can tell by the name, the dual control model, it's got two primary parts. It has a sexual accelerator or gas pedal, which notices all the sex-related stimulation in the environment. So that's everything you see, hear, smell, touch, think, believe, or imagine that your brain codes as sex-related. And it sends the turn-on signal that many of us are familiar mm -hmm. with. And it's functioning all the time at 
a level below consciousness. Here we are talking about sex, thinking about the idea of sex, like what would count as like a sound that's sex related to me? What would count as a smell that's sex related to me? Just that little bit is enough to be like, well, there's some sex related thinking. And so I'm going to send a turn on signal. Um, Fortunately, at the same time, in parallel, your brakes the other part of it are noticing all the good reasons not to be turned on right now. <laughs> Everything that you see, hear, smell, touch, taste, think, believe, or imagine that your brain causes a potential threat. Mm. And this is the big one. This is the mm. normalizing, oh, look, it's totally normal and healthy and good for there to be things hitting my break. And mm-hmm. uh, the process of arousal is a dual process of turning on the ons, yes, but also turning off the offs. And it turns out when people are struggling with any aspect of their sexual functioning, arousal, pleasure, desire, orgasm, sometimes it's because there's not enough stimulation to the accelerator, but much more often it's because there's too much stimulation to the break because stress hits the break, Mm -hmm. body image stuff hits the break, trauma history hits the break, relationship trouble hits the breaks, your kids hit the break. (laughs) So is this one and the same of your sex drive or do you describe it differently? You hear people always be like, my sex drive. Yeah. The technical language uh, would say that sex is not a drive Mm. because a drive is a biological mechanism in an organism's Mm. body that is like an alarm, like a flashing red light and a wooga, a wooga klaxon sound that there's some problem that needs to get solved. And there's an uncomfortable internal experience that pushes the animal out into the world to go solve that problem. Hunger is a drive. Thirst is a drive. Sleep mm. is a drive. Thermoregulation. If you do not meet these needs, a wooga, a wooga, there's a problem. Fix it. If you don't meet these <laughs> needs, what happens? Eventually, you will literally die. You can literally Mm. die of sleep deprivation. You can literally die of loneliness, right? Love, connection is a biological drive. Sex is not one of those. Nobody has ever died because they couldn't get laid. (laughs) They may think they might. They may feel (laughs) uncomfortable. Feeling uncomfortable or frustrated is not the same as suffering tissue damage. And the fact that you have been told this before, the fact that you say, jokingly, people feel like they might is actually super important. So if sex is not a drive, what is it then? How do we categorize it? Let me, I'm I'm realistic. I know we're not going to live in a world (laughs) where we all say that sex is an incentive motivation system. Sex drive is so much easier to say. Everybody, Mm. (laughs) but if we can understand that that we're using it in a sort of like layperson term, a casual, not literal kind of way, if we can recognize that we're using the term sex drive, what we actually mean is a sexual incentive motivation system that is not analogous to hunger, but rather to curiosity, exploration, play. All of these things are equally innate to us. The difference is Mm -hmm. just that we don't die if we don't get it. And our desire to explore, to read new books, to play new games, to watch new movies is... It comes and goes, right? There are some times when you just want to like watch the same movie you've watched a thousand times, read the same book you've read a thousand times. There are times when all you want to do is like curl up in bed in silence. Those are times when you are feeling stressed, overwhelmed, exhausted, anxious, depressed. Those are the times when you're not interested in sex too, probably. Well, it's 80 for 80 to 90% of people. Those are times when your interest in sex is like, no, thanks. I want to break down the dual control model a little yes. more. And I love, I think the overarching theme I got from your book is that there's no, everything is normal. There's nothing that isn't. And I think that's really important, especially with sex. That's such, that can be such a sensitive topic. People but we will were... want to argue with that. So let me make sure, because people find it very difficult <laughs> to be like, okay. what do you mean everything is normal? Do you mean Everything is normal. And here are two things that do not count as normal from my point of view. One, uh, unwanted pain. Mm. It's not supposed to hurt unless you choose for it to hurt. If you enjoy pain with your sexual experience, great, go for it. Uh, And the reason that happens is explained in chapter three. So you go. But unwanted pain is not normal. 
talk to a medical provider. Mm -hmm. And I don't say that glibly because a lot of people when they're experiencing pain with sex uh, get dismissed by medical providers who don't know better. Mm. So you are going to have to put a like legwork into finding a provider who will take you seriously and refer you to, for example, a physical therapist, which is like the most promising intervention for most experiences of sexual pain. So that's one thing that's not normal. If you're experiencing, and I, I have had this conversation where people are like, and, and it hurt, but like that was just, you know, and I was like, no, that is a thing that not to accept. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you want to go ahead, but no. And then the second thing that's not normal, obviously, is lack of consent. Yeah, right? Everybody involved should be glad to be there yes. and free to leave whenever they choose without any consequences. Right. I'm glad that you specified that. I think what I thought was good about the normal comment was more of different desires mm-hmm. and different, you know, like yeah. the sexual breaks. And Everything gas else pedal. is normal. Your breaks yes. are normal. Responsive <laughs> desire is normal. Arousal non-concordance where there's a mismatch between between your genitals and how you feel emotionally. That's normal. normal. If you want to fuck your partner's armpit, that is normal. normal. There's a word for it. It's called <laughs> axillary intercourse. Do you? As long as everybody involved is glad to be there and free to leave without consequence, go for it. You can do anything you want. All normal. Love it. I think what was really fun, though, in your book is there was a quiz about like oh, yeah. the sexual excitation system, the SE, and the sexual inhibition system, SI. And you were saying the most common was to kind of be in the middle for, for both. both. Yep. You and I took the quiz, which was super fun. I actually scored <laughs> super high in the sexual excitation and low in the sexual hi- inhibition. Okay. Julie's like turned on right now. There's nothing apparently, but um, you you were more in the middle. I was definitely right, in the middle, both. and I I think what was so groundbreaking for me in this chapter, Emily, and I I'm so grateful for you for telling us this is a, a lot of times we focus on the SE and not mo- not so much the SI and they are separate things. So when we don't have sex for a while with our partner, we think we're we're missing the stimulation, mm-hmm. we're missing the excitation. So we focus so much of our time on buying lingerie and going on public and trying to have sex in public when the SI I'm actually more sensitive in that area. I have more breaks than I do excitation. Mm. So we ha- I have to work on eliminating more of the breaks for me to really get aroused. Interesting. And then I was gonna I wanted to ask you, Emily, how do you think it differs for men and women? When you look at the research, it does like if you had to guess which group men or women had <laughs> overall more sensitive accelerators. Probably men. Yep. Yeah. And who has the more sensitive breaks? As a population, if you average together the break sensitivity of 100 women and the break sensitivity of 100 men, the average score of the women is going to be higher. There is an enormous range of variability as just the two of you represent. People vary tremendously and all of that variation is normal. There's nothing dysfunctional about any of it. It does mean that there's different pronenesses, but why do men score higher on average on exciters and lower on inhibitors? Is it innate? The only way we would know if it was like biologically innate is if we tested it in like one hour old infant humans. <laughs> and uh, I don't see anyone getting like human IRB approval right. for like Not yet. <laughs> studying that. Right. This research. Like what's yeah. ethical? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's so it, it, I guess it could be innate, but it is probably because of the cultural messages with which a human being is raised from the moment mm-hmm. of their birth mm-hmm. based on like the shape of the genitals between their legs that makes the adults around them go, it's a boy or it's a girl. You get totally different messages. Actually, it was told the story of a woman who read Come As You Are and then watched her adult grown up brother changing his baby daughter's diaper. Uh, and when she was all clean and ready to go, he reaches to get the diaper. And when he turns back, little baby daughter is touching her own genitals. Mm. And dad goes, mm. uh-uh, don't touch that. And like, you have to wonder, um, how would he have responded if his baby mm. had had a penis instead? Oh, yeah. Be like, mm-hmm. go for it. Keep going. Yeah, like, ha ha. Or if she had been touching any other body part, like, don't we love it when babies mm-hmm. touch, like, find their feet? <laughs> Did you find your feet? Oh, you got the cutest little feet. <laughs> so she's not going to remember, this baby's not going to remember that moment of her dad scolding her for touching her own body, but it will accumulate with countless other moments that she also will not remember. Right. So that by the time she gets to adolescence and adulthood, there's going to be this dark place in her brain where her genitals should be because she's been taught over years of virtually silent messages that that part of her body does not belong to her and it's a source of shame 
him and discussed. Mm. So would you say then still that the majority of people like from your research fall in the middle of both or? Yeah. Okay. So that's still like regardless of your sexual preference, regardless of your gender, sex, like all of that, it's kind of even distribution on the bell curve. Yeah. Been, there have been multiple studies with many, many different populations and it just over and over again, it turns out it has the same sort of distribution as any personality trait where like most people are heaped up in the middle and then there's a few people out right. on the edges. And But the people who are out on the edges are not abnormal. They're just right. atypical. And it does result in different pronuses. So if you have a particular, like for example, if you have a really sensitive accelerator, especially if it's in combination with a not particularly sensitive brake, that sounds like it can be really fun. And in the right context, it absolutely can be. But these are also the folks who might be most at risk for uh, using sex as a strategy to manage stress, depression, anxiety, mm. loneliness, repress, rage, we've all got it, or engage in compulsive sexual behavior or sexual risk taking. In the wrong context, it can actually increase risk. Yeah, I wonder though, because I scored high and low, but um, it's maybe it's some of its context because I'm with someone. All of it is context. Yeah, I was going to say, like, I don't know if I would have if I wasn't with the current partner I'm with right this yes. minute. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I was going to ask, how often does that change. It's like introversion, extroversion. Like you have a, a personality, a proneness, a temperament. So I'm I'm like a real strong introvert. But even I ha phase into times of like wanting to spend more time with people and feeling more energized and less drained by a time with people, depending on the context and the situation. It's going to vary the way you'll respond to those questions. There'll be a sort of like a, a proneness that you'll notice that you tend to have a more or less sensitive gas pedal compared to your partner or other people. But but where it falls precisely is going to vary depending on the context. Yeah. And so should we take the quiz at different points in our life, depending on context? Don't stress. What will it do for you to have a different score on a little Cosmo quiz? Like I used <laughs> items from the actual science, but like that is not a scientific quiz. It's very much like a Cosmo quiz just to give you a place to start mm -hmm. in thinking about the sensitivity of your accelerator and brake. And for most people, because most people are in the middle, it's much less about how sensitive are my mm. brakes and accelerator and much more about like, there's a break. Right. So let's talk about those breaks in context a little more, because I think context is key as we keep playing Heck into. Yes. <laughs> so yes. I feel like in movies, you see, it's just like, let's put some candles and roses, and then we're going to immediately have sex. Like, which right. cues do you think matter more than others and which ones don't? Which cues matter more? Okay. So when you look at the research, it's, it's really so rarely about what I actually think. Sometimes it's about what I think, but mostly <laughs> it's what does the research tells us. And the research tells us that um, personal well-being mm. really matters. Mental and physical health. Obviously, if you currently have the flu, that's not going to facilitate really flexible and responsive turning off the brakes. Like you're just going to be like, no. Per partner characteristics. And we can think flexibly about what counts as a partner characteristic because it varies from person to person. For me, it's sense of humor. Like when my partner is funny, that's mm -hmm. like a big deal for me. Uh, my sister is a musician, married to a musician. So for her, sitting in the living room when he's in the piano room practicing, mm. she's just sitting there like, mm. turned on. <laughs> I married the right man. <laughs> Right. And that's like, that's not a thing for me, but it is a thing for her. So partner characteristics writ large. Sometimes it might be even though, you know, parenting is not a sexy behavior. If you have kids and you're watching your co-parent with your kids, you can just be like, damn, I'm with the right person. I made mm. a good choice here. Or like doing whatever their job is and they're really good at it and you just love seeing them be extraordinary at whatever their thing is. Uh, so partner characteristics is the second thing. The third thing is relationship characteristics. Most important among the relationship characteristics is trust. Mm. So uh, there's a relationship researcher and therapist named Sue Johnson who developed emotionally focused therapy, EFT. Yeah. Uh, and she defines trust as basically the answer to the question, are you there for me? Mm. R meaning, so R stands for emotionally accessible, emotionally responsive, and emotionally engaged. When I show up with a feeling, you are emotionally present and with me, responsive and engaged. Uh, and it's extremely important with sex because there's a lot of vulnerability mm -hmm. involved in sex. You might be taking off some clothes and letting somebody see parts of your body almost no one else will see. 
or touching parts of your body. Almost no one else will touch. You might be putting a part of your body inside a part of someone else's body or letting them put a part of their body right. inside your body. Like it takes so much trust. And if you take off your clothes and your partner is like, wow, yay, and <laughs> thank you, then they are really there for you. Yeah. Whereas if you show up and take off your clothes and your partner's like, you know, okay. Right. I mean, right? I could see that having a huge impact on your, that. I would probably have, score totally different if I took that quiz with that. Yeah, you that's, know? that's a partner who's not there for you. Uh, and that's like a key relationship factor. I love the example you gave in your book with someone when they asked their partner, why do you want to have sex? Why do you like having sex with me? And her partner answered, because you're beautiful. And I yeah. really love this example because it wasn't about treating her like a piece of meat because you're hot or I like your body. He's just saying baseline, you're beautiful. I'm just so attracted to you. And to me, that's yeah. also something that is is an SE for me to hear, you know, mm -hmm. something, these words of uh, affirmation. Yeah. So in that real story, it's grounded in like a true story. And it was specifically about someone who was feeling very self-conscious about the changes that had happened to her body after having a child. Like so much <laughs> happens to your body. And it's not just that there are like visible physical changes. It's that like the way your body experiences sensations changes. The meaning of your various body parts changes. And she was really struggling with learning how to love this body. Mm -hmm. And she had absorbed, as we all have, a lot of like cultural messages about like getting your pre-baby body back and blah, blah, blah. It's all bullshit and noise. Yeah. And we can talk about that later if you want to. But uh, <laughs> what he said when she was like, why would you even, why would you even want to have sex with this is actually what she said. Why would you want to have sex with this? And he's like, because you're beautiful. And I've heard the story over and over, actually, especially after the book came out. Men kept telling me about how gorgeous they found their partners after they had a child. Mm. That like they like either like were in no way bothered by the changes or actively loved the changes to their partner's body after a child came along. And yeah, I have also heard stories about men who were like, well, I don't know. She doesn't look the way she used to. But many more stories of men being like, she gets hotter every day. <laughs> well, if you want to have sex, that's what you should be saying because the yeah. other is going to turn it off. <laughs> and not just what you say, but what you actually feel because yes. like, let's face it, like when you are in a long term relationship, especially if you like get married and do the whole like till death do us part thing. I don't know about you, but like I intend not to die while still having the body I currently have. I got decades ahead of me, I hope. If I'm right. lucky enough to grow old and my partner is lucky enough to grow old, then both of us are going to be old, baggy, wrinkled, bald, gray haired, scars from surgery, metal hips, like our bodies are going to be really different by the time death does us part. That's that's the deal. Like when you yeah, get married because your partner looks the way they do, you're not marrying that body. You're marrying the whole future of that body. That's love. Let's take a quick break from this insightful conversation with Emily for a couple of messages. This episode is made possible by Lugs. Amidst the golden age of the 90s, Lugs found its footing as a leader within the footwear and fashion space. Priding itself on quality materials and supreme comfort, the brand never wavered with the passing of trends. Whether you remember the brand's early appeal within the hip-hop culture or the countless celebrity endorsements, one thing remains the same, Lugs' distinctive style. Julie and I both have a few different styles of Lugs shoes ranging from their iconic boots to their canvas sneakers. Even though they're so different in style, one thing remains the same. They're all so comfortable and light. I love my flirt high zip boots that I can wear with cute summer dresses and my canvas sneakers go so perfectly with my jeans and t-shirts. Fun, comfortable, everyday wear, realistically priced and affordable. So go treat yourself. You can never have too many pairs of lugs. Exclusively for our beautiful listeners, get 30% off full price items now by going to lugs.com and entering the code DATEABLE. Again, that's L-U-G-Z.com and entering the code D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E for 30% off full price items. Let's face it, it's a weird time to be dating or developing relationships. 
Have you recently decided that you want to make some changes to your love life? Maybe you've recently re-entered the dating scene. Maybe you've gone on one too many dates that went nowhere. Or maybe you're ready to take your current relationship to the next level. That is exactly why we created The Sounding Board, a true extension of our podcast that delivers a personalized experience, which includes one-on-one coffee dates with us, a monthly dateable live after show, exclusive audio content, and much more. Allow Julie and I become your dating Sherpas to provide real-time guidance and wisdom in a more intimate way so we can navigate dating and relationships together. Join the sounding board today by going to datablepodcast.com slash sounding board. Again, that's datablepodcast.com slash sounding board. Okay, let's get back into this combo. Yeah, I think the body is such an, I, I mean, I've definitely felt that. I think it's like, if you're not feeling great about your body, and obviously, if you have a partner that's not, you know, receiving it well, that's another whole thing. I mean, if you're in a situation where there's a lot of stress going on, whether that's your own feel, or let's say the other flip side of having kids is that you're just, like, you know, run down and tired, and oh, yeah. whatever, or maybe you start a new job, whatever life throws at you. Do you just accept that this is a point in time? Or like, are there ways to kind of reactivate your SE? So yeah, no, don't worry about, oh, it's very rare that the thing to focus on is adding stimulation to the accelerator. <laughs> Nearly always the idea is like, so what's what's hitting the brakes right now? And what control do I have over that? Are there things that mm. I can do to like take some pressure off the brakes so that the accelerator is free to do its job? And mm. there absolutely are going to be times when like, nope, nope, the gas pedal the, is like fine, but man, the brakes are just on the floor right now. I got mm-hmm. the foot brake on. I got the handbrake pulled up. Like <laughs> we're just we're just not going anywhere right now. Like if you just brought a brand new baby into your life, no, you're not going to be getting any sleep. The whole idea of your body is going to be weird and kind of just like baby hands touching your body and the whole meaning of your body parts is now about like parenting and how do you transition out of parenting mode into hey, sexy lady mode. Right. Like That takes practice and effort. So there is no more ironic way to uh, not experience any interest in sex than to judge yourself for how little interest you have in sex. Because if you're like, you're like trying to like get in the mood and you're like, what's going on? And it's been weeks or months and I still am not in this place. And you're like judging yourself and criticizing yourself. And maybe your partner is like, should you see a doctor? Do you think there's something wrong with you? Is is any (laughs) of that activating the accelerator? Is that, is that sex related stimuli that's turned? No, it's all hitting the brakes. So if you like take take sexual desire, take sexual interest, take sexual behavior off the table entirely, no pressure, no judgment, no performance, no performance anxiety. You just allow there to be like a breathing moment in your connection where you take space. When we study people who uh, have great sexual connections, these are not people who necessarily sustain a strong sexual connection constantly. They're not the ones who never find that there is distance between them. They're the ones who finding that there's distance between them find their way back to each other. this is very timely because you talk about stress and how it can, you know, absolutely contribute to our SI hitting the brakes. But you also make a clear line between stressors and stress. Oh, yeah. I would love for you to explain (laughs) what that is because I, to me, that was the most helpful definition. And also, how do we manage stress, not in a way that society tells us to manage stress, but in a healthy way? Yeah. So the short answer is chapter four of Come As You Are and then all of burnout. (laughs) (laughs) The the single best predict. So Come As You Are is really focused on like women's sexual well-being, not because women most deserve sexual well-being, but because the cultural denial of their sexual autonomy and pleasure, access to pleasure is the foundation of, I think, all the evils in the world. And it turns out the uh, best predictor of a woman's sexual well-being is surprise her overall well-being. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure that applies to men too, right? Anyone's overall well-being yes. is going to help them. <laughs> yes, uh, for everybody, yeah. So because people were like, this is the most important chapter in this book, that's actually why uh, Burnout was the next book. So chapter four of Come As You Are and one of Burnout are 
beginning with this idea that the process of dealing with your stress, which is the physiological thing that happens in your body, the adrenaline and cortisol and all these things we read about with a fight or flight response, which is mm -hmm. actually fight, flight, freeze, fawn. And then there's your stress. It's, it's dealing with that is separate from the process of dealing with your stressors, which are the things that cause, that activate the stress response in your body. Our mm -hmm. stressors, to take like an extreme example, are like traffic. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Like biologically, your stress response is the same when you're sitting in terrible traffic, when you are surrounded by douchebags, as it is when you're being literally chased by a predator, like a lion, right? Like, so you're on the savannah of Africa running and your body is doing what it is designed to do, feeding you this adrenaline and stuff so that you can run to escape, right? So you're sitting in traffic surrounded by douchebags and your body is pumping out this adrenaline and stuff and like trying to help you mm -hmm. out. And running is not the behavior that's going to fix this situation. You just need to wait. <laughs> so by the time when you're running away from a lion, if you like, if there's only two possible outcomes here, right? Either you get eaten by the lion or you survive. So imagine you run all the way back to your village and you outrun the lion and you jump up and down and you explain and you tell the story to your friends and family and you feel so relieved and grateful and the sun seems to shine brighter, right? When you get out of your car after you've been in traffic for 45 minutes, you get out of your car, do you suddenly feel glad to be alive and the sun seems to shine brighter and you love your friends and family? Or do you still want to punch somebody in the face and you kind of <laughs> accidentally take it out on the first mammal you see when you walk in the door? Your partner. Yeah. So, so that's the difference between dealing with the stress and dealing with the stressor. If you get home from the terrible traffic, you have dealt with the stressor, yay. If you, there is, you know, some uh, douchebag at work who you mm. just like, I just, you, the way to deal with that is not going to be the way your adrenaline wants you to deal with it, which is to like, you know, lean over the table and slap them across the jaw. That is not appropriate. That's just not a thing you can do. Legally. Yeah. Like <laughs> no, literally for legal reasons, it is not correct. That is, that is not the socially appropriate thing to do. The socially appropriate thing to do is to like have a rational conversation, maybe mediated. Like, you know, you are a grown up who manages your feelings. You put the pause button on your stress response, you hold on to it until you are in an appropriate place. And then separate from dealing with the stressor, you deal with the stress itself, which is you can deal with with physical activity, you can deal with it with a big old cry. I love that one. Mm -hmm. Belly laugh, another great one. Creative self expression, uh, using your imagination, imagine just, just like sit in your office with your eyes closed and imagine that you are Godzilla, and you are stomping all over the douchebags office and destroying all their their crap and their that you're allowed to do you're allowed to do anything you want in your imagination right so how this comes back and let me know if i'm filling this incorrectly is stress is going to put the brakes on for most people anything. yeah yes so any ways that we can like de-stress and address this stuff that's going to help with overall sexual happiness yeah, it'll, because it fixes your overall well-being. And also some people feel like they can distract themselves from stress with sex. And I feel like for mm. me personally, having sex while I'm stressed actually adds to my anxiety and my stress. Mm. So it is okay to say to my partner, I'm taking a pause so I can work through my stress before we have amazing sex. Right. So one of the things that we get, we've got in this question a lot is like, what happens when my partner and I have different, I would have said sex drives in the past, but now I want to say like SE and SI. Levels of interest in sex or motivation. Exactly. Like, how do you address that situation? I feel feel like what you hear in, you know, bad Cosmo advice is, you know, like set the candles, buy sex toys, like basically adding to the SE where what I'm kind of gathering from you is maybe it's focusing on the SI a little more. It's absolutely 100% focus on the SI more. Yeah. So if so, suppose we got partner A and partner B, partner A has higher interest in sex, would like sex more frequently. Partner B has lower interest in sex, would like sex less frequently. First of all, there is an automatic judgment about one of the person having a more correct level of sexual interest correct. than the other yes. one. Yes. 
right? And that's wrong. That's already, you're starting off wrong right there. That probably adds stress right away to right. the other yeah. person. Because <laughs> then one person is like the diagnosed patient. And usually it's the higher desire person who's like the better sexual yeah. interest. And the lower desire person is the worse. Like there's something wrong and broken with you if you have lower interest in sex. That already, so like start from a place of like both of us are equally correct and normal and healthy in our level of interest in sex. No one's broken. We just have a relationship where we need to like figure out a compromise, a way to make this work. And if I'm the higher desire partner in my relationship, then what I want to do is I want to figure out everything that's hitting my partner's brakes mm -hmm. and just sweep them away, get mm -hmm. rid of them. I went to, uh, I originally heard this story actually from Sarah Wendell of- uh, oh, uh, oh, yes. Yeah. A frolic, of which favorites. is how we got connected, yes. our network, shared network. <laughs> she tells the story of being in an elevator and listening to people having the conversation like these characters in these romance novels they can be like literally running away from the bad guy they're being shot at and they hide in a closet running away from the bad guy and they have sex in the closet while they're like <laughs> and and this woman is like i can't have sex if there's still a dish in the sink <laughs> right like that's it's a distraction. It's an interruption. Her brain is still on that dish and not letting it go. The wrong, easy way to address that is to like tell the person, well, you just need to like be more mindful, be more present in the moment. Let go of the dish and turn your attention to the pleasurable things happening in the here and now. But what if, what if I, as the higher desire partner in relationship with that person, heard my partner say, I'm sorry, I'm just like, my brain is really stuck on uh, that last coffee cup. I, mm -hmm. as the higher desire person, can be like, you know what, baby? Go fucking clean it. I'm going to go clean that dish. <laughs> and I come up like a superhero. Yes. I did the dish. You smell that dish soap, baby? Mm. I mean, I've literally heard stories about laundry. This is a real, laundry's a really big one. It's a huge Hitting one. And the breaks, people like, because there's so many steps and you just have to like wait until the next step is ready. So like, you know, you've got date night and the last little laundry never got folded. Yeah. Uh, so the story as it was told to me was like, I'm in bed. I'm waiting for my partner to come up. I'm naked. I'm just like, can we, can we just get this done? <laughs> The to-do list really fucks you up. Yeah, I just want to cross it off. Um, it, but partner comes up with the laundry basket naked and is like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> I'm going to put away the laundry. I'm going to hang up <laughs> each of your t-shirts. doesn't make any sense to hang up a t-shirt, but that is the way you like it. And like, you know, like bending over in a sexy way. It's playful. It's supposed to be funny and silly. But yeah, if I'm the higher desire partner, if I want to have sex more frequently or greater pleasure with the sex that we have, then I want to get rid of everything that is hitting my partner's brakes. And remove it for mm -hmm. your partner. But what about something like this? This I'm asking for a friend. Uh, our, my friend <laughs> says... <laughs> UA's question. <laughs> she cannot have sex e in humidity or when she's sweaty and sticky. But her partner is totally fine fucking in that kind of environment. How could the partner help remove that break for my friend? I feel like an air conditioner costs about $100. <laughs> <laughs> See, there's a solution to everything. There's a solution. You just need to find the solution. Like, what is like, put a big red bow on the box, be like, baby, I made an investment in us. I love this, but let's say, let's say this is a sore subject in your relationship. Sure. Which it is for a lot of people. Is. Which it is. And I feel like the more you bring it up, the more their breaks probably stop, oh, yeah. right? Like, cause Welcome now it's- Welcome to the chasing dynamic. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> I can't, I mean, I've never been in this situation, but I'm only like imagining if someone was like, why don't you want to have sex? Why don't you want to have sex? That's going to make me more nervous to have sex. How yeah. do you have yeah. these conversations- you know, in a way that you can understand what their breaks are. So it becomes a solution rather than just having this circular convo or, you know, pulling out all the exciters yeah. that aren't doing anything, just adding pressure. So the, how do we have, how do I ask my partner for, how do I talk to my partner about question? Ultimate answer is, well, you just talk about it. You just do it. And the question, again, it's not about like, how do I physically go and do it? It's what are the things that are standing in my way? What am I afraid could possibly happen? Uh, I generally answer this question with two dad jokes. One, uh, we love dad jokes. How do hedgehogs have sex? Very carefully. <laughs> and then uh, this is this is a, a 
30s, 40s guy arrives, a musician. He arrives in New York City. He says to his cab driver, hey, fella, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And the cab driver looks at him and goes, practice, practice, practice. Mm. <laughs> Get it? How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, <laughs> practice, practice. So the answer to how do I talk about it is very carefully. And practice, practice, practice. The The real question to ask is, well, there's a lot of questions to ask. And what I've found is that one of the most useful things that I can do in a short amount of time is to instruct people what the good questions are. Because it's not, how do I want sex more? The question is, what is it that I want mm. when I want sex? Hmm. What is it that I don't want? When I don't want sex. What is it that I like when I like sex? What is it that I don't like when I don't like sex? For both people to answer these questions and be able to talk about it, because it's not just that you like the pleasure and or and you don't just want orgasm, because you can do that by yourself. Mm -hmm, so yeah. what is it about having mm. another person and specifically this other person with you that contributes something powerful and important to your well-being, to your sense of joy, to your sense of fulfillment as a human being. What is it that you want? What is it that you like or don't want and don't like? And that opens up the possibility of having a conversation that's not about the power struggle because so often people frame uh, sex as a resource to fight over in a relationship. Mm -hmm. And it's not. It is. There, oh, I'm, I'm going to not go to the dark place of things that have happened culturally. We can save that for another episode. But it is a really <laughs> great point because we are sold into this narrative that in a new relationship, you fuck like bunnies. And then at some point, you get so used to each other that you start having less sex and the sex is not good. But what you're really saying here, and this is my takeaway, is that sex gets better with time because you start to learn your partner's SEs and SIs. And it becomes a puzzle. You can, how do we crank up the SEs and how do we get rid of the SIs? Mm -hmm. So in yes. that theory, sex should get better and better as you get to know your partner. Yeah. And that is absolutely how it works. When people are willing to abandon the script that somebody somewhere planted in our heads that says, here is how sex is supposed to work. It's supposed to be spontaneous. It's supposed mm -hmm. to happen easily. Uh, you're supposed to sort of, it has an order of operations. You do things in this order. You engage in these behaviors, but not in these other behaviors. Boom, boom, boom. And you're done. And we can tell somebody's done because somebody ejaculates in somebody else's body. That's how you know. If we are willing, and um, in the research on people who have extraordinary sex, this is what they say. How do you get to be a person who has sex that makes you feel like you're like plugged into the universe? You mm -hmm. abandon everything you were ever taught about sex, gender, pleasure, bodies, trust, shame, love, and you connect deeply with what those things are for you personally, regardless of what somebody taught you. And you connect deeply with what those things are for your partners, mm -hmm. regardless of what the world taught you that was supposed to be. You really pay attention to you and to your partner. And you customize sex and make it exactly what it can be for you specifically without regard to what anybody says it's supposed to be. This is the, the confidence and joy thing that I talk about all the time. Confidence is knowing what is actually true, knowing that responsive desire is not only normal, but great. Knowing about mm -hmm. the dual control model, knowing what kinds of stuff hits your brakes, knowing that one level of desire is not better or worse than another level of desire. Yeah. And joy is the hard part. Joy is loving what's true. Yeah. About your sexuality, your body, your relationship, and the world you live in. And knowing what's true and loving what's true requires that you recognize the ways that you've been lied to your whole life about how <laughs> sex should work. Mm -hmm. And when you can do that, you become freed up to do exactly what you were talking about, to begin to like pay really great attention to your own brakes and accelerator, to your partner's brakes and accelerator, uh, and to play the game of like, how can we create space for mm. our erotic selves to emerge under the like mountainous pile of other crap we have to deal with in our lives? To be able to play with each other in this specific, fun, goofy way we humans play. I love that. And I think, I mean, there's so many takeaways. We'll move on to that. This is, episode has just been jam-packed, you know, nuggets and stuff. And obviously, people can read your book. It's 110,000 words. <laughs> That's it. People can read no the biggie. book to even get more. But I think the biggest thing I learned from this, and I know it's one of those things that I think I knew, but I didn't think about as much, of just how much environment plays 
in to sex. The whole like working off of, you know, the stressors and what is, you know, pumping those brakes. Like I, I never thought that was the way to kind of get you the sex life that you wanted. Like it's only, it's almost like counterintuitive, yet it makes so much sense. So I think for me, that's a really great takeaway from all this. And I mean, you keep drilling this home besides the two things that you pointed out. Everything is normal. There is no right or wrong. Like no one ha- is better or worse. And I think that can change at different stages of your life based on what's going on. And, you know, if something like someone can't orgasm or like something is coming up, it's not that there's something wrong. It's just maybe there's a stress that's happening that's causing this. Yeah. And- like, for example, you're worried about how long your orgasm is taking. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel like sometimes we jump to like, what am I doing wrong? Or what am I doing wrong for my partner. And it's usually not about that. It's usually about these external contexts that's happening. Yeah. It frees up the whole like blame judgment. Like you can just be set free from all of that stuff and be like, how do we, so here's this puzzle that we have. How do we solve it together? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not being afraid to communicate. I think sex is the one area that a lot of people are afraid to communicate because it feels so personal. It feels so high stakes, right? Mm -hmm. Like we really Mm -hmm. don't want to hurt our partner's feelings and make them feel judged or criticized in any way. And we're all so tender and like, it feels like the least little criticism could just like devastate them. Yes. If there, if I have any like concrete tip about communication, stay as positive as you possibly can. Mm-hmm. Make your partner feel like a superhero. I love how we do X, Y, Z. I want our sex life to be the best sex I've ever had with anybody yes. ever. Yeah. And uh, let's talk about how we can create that together. I love that. And I think just the words of affirmation actually do play so much into it. I think what you were saying too, of just being with the partner characteristics, how much that impacts. Trust and and I definitely appreciation, can see that. Gratitude, yeah. Gratitude, all the like self-help buzzwords. I yeah. know, it's, I, like I say things like gratitude and affirmation. And I'm like, oh, please, but no, but really. True. They're so good. It is. It's, it's so good. true. Yeah. And usually if sex, things aren't going well in your sex life, there is something deeper going on that's not just physical for the most part. Not yeah. always, but yes. It's all related. My takeaway is after reading your book, I just thought, wow, society's really fucked up about the way we <laughs> educate and talk about sex. You even mentioned the right. fact that before someone turns 18, everything about sex is about no, 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 all the dangers and fears around mm-hmm. sex. As soon as a woman turns 18, she's expected to be this minx, like go fuck, go have the best sex <laughs> of your life. And she hasn't been taught to do that. And then if she has too much sex or too little sex, her boobs are too big or too little. You are always doing it wrong. You always are doing always, it wrong. It's always failing. too much or too little and and the normal way of doing things, nobody's doing it that way. What I took away was we have to unsubscribe from these beliefs that came out of nowhere. And you talk about ac- accidental environment. You were brought into an environment to learn all of this, not by your own choice, because you were accidentally brought into this world. Of, well, you know, accidentally not yeah. by your parents, but you didn't get, you, to, you didn't get to You didn't get to choose. <laughs> but any given moment in time, we have have the option and the power to question, do I actually believe this? Or did I just Mm -hmm. freely subscribe to this belief without even questioning it? So that is really empowering to know. I also love this idea of creating the best sex with your partner. Um, Mm -hmm. Something we talk about on our show is everybody loves to list their turn ons and turn offs. And I would challenge people to stop doing that because it's not one size fits all. Your turn ons with one partner are going to be different with another partner. The fact that I love mm-hmm. forearms on my current partner, does that mean that I will love every forearm that I see? So I think it's great to know that like the concept that sex is a very customized thing yes. makes it much more liberating to know that whatever you experience with your your sexual partner is different from time to time and you can treat it like an experiment and just keep experimenting. Yes. And it changes with every level of granularity. So like you may love the forearms on this person, but like no other forearms. Yeah. And also when this person with the great forearms like touches you in the special way in a certain special spot mm-hmm. today, your knees melt. 
But tomorrow you're like extra overwhelmed and exhausted and that same certain special someone touches Mm. that same certain special place in a certain special way. And you're like, will you please just go right? Do the dishes. (laughs) That is normal. Mm. That is that is how our brain's perception of sensation works. That is normal. I think that's really important too. Because like for me, I'm at the start of a new relationship. And I think like sometimes you fear that like that honeymoon period will be over. And I think that knowing that it's normal, that things go in waves is super helpful that there's nothing wrong per se. Like Mm -hmm. this is just life and sex is one part of life. But if we were just having sex all the time, like humanity wouldn't be doing anything else. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Well, like (laughs) you have to sleep sometimes. We just be procreating all the time. That's it. (laughs) Well, you wouldn't. The weird thing, this is a a side note, but there is actually not a relationship between frequency of intercourse and uh, Mm. reproduction. Oh, shit. Just like more about the time when you do it. Yeah. Yeah. Because the presence of the egg is the limiting factor. And like it's there whether you have sex or not. And if if the sperm is present when the egg is present, then there's a possibility of pregnancy. So if you have sex every day, like 28 days out of 30, there wasn't any chance you were going to get pregnant anyway. So the, anyway, people <laughs> are like, oh, is, is the reason we have a reduction in population because people are having sex less frequently? No, that no. is not why. No. Yeah. No, <laughs> not at all. They're just using <laughs> contraception. <laughs> that's all. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> they don't want kids. <laughs> that's that. Yeah, all. yeah that's people that's are maybe making choices and having control over their bodies more than they ever have at any point in history. Mm-hmm. Like I would rather be alive now than at any time in the past. And I'm sure. God, I hope 50 years from now, if I'm still here, I'll be like, I'd rather be alive now than at any Mm -hmm. other time because people are more free. They have more opportunity to choose and they have more cultural permission to be exactly who they are and love exactly who they love and enjoy what they love. I love hearing that. Thank you so much, Emily. You know, this is we were only able to cover like one third of the book. There's just so much (laughs) more in the book. In addition to all of this. We didn't even talk about orgasm. We didn't talk about orgasm. orgasm. I I was on our list yes <laughs> i want to talk about the hymen myth which was like oh, whoa what the fuck on. that's yeah. crazy so <laughs> i guess this will be a great teaser for anybody who has not read your book or listened to your book i've been listening to it um audio and it's so great to hear your voice here and then i hear you on my walks <laughs> and so there's just so much more to uncover with the book but also your book burnout is fabulous you wrote this with your twin sister mm-hmm. that's really crazy she's a musician <laughs> burnout affects so many aspects of our life including our sex life. So also a very important mm-hmm. book to, to read and put on our radars. Now, anything else you're working Especially on? Especially with the pandemic. People oh, have yes. Been, oh. Like, that it, of any book, this is burnout is the one I would wish least were relevant to people's lives, but yeah. it is just more and more relevant since it came out in 2019. Um, so I'm currently in book proposal mode for the next Ooh. book. Ooh, exciting. Yeah. Which is um, obviously a proposal, don't have a title or anything like that yet. But the idea is that writing Come As You Are was really, really bad for my own sex life. Oh, (laughs) writing a book is terrible. It's very stressful. (laughs) And so even though I'm like thinking and talking about sex all day, every day, I'm so stressed that I have no interest in actually having any sex uh, (laughs) for like months at a time, nothing. Uh, And so the book is about what I needed to know as a sex expert to be able to find my way back to my own sexuality mm. and my connection with my partner who is like the greatest human on the face of the earth and I admire and adore him um, and he deserved more from me I felt but my beating myself up was not helping so it's it's a uh, how I fixed it we are definitely going to have you back on the show to talk yeah. about that that <laughs> is so fascinating that is living proof that everything is normal yeah, <laughs> you know? literally literally like if I can experience it anyone can Experience anyone, it. Right. But if I can fix it, if I can fix it, anyone can fix it. That is true. so hopeful for it's people. True. When should we? When can we expect that book to come out? <laughs> no, twenty twenty three. She's like, my stressors are going. I'm literally, up. I'm literally <laughs> just writing the proposal right now, and I also it's like a million projects, and I don't know. Okay, all right, all right. Go, go have sex. My <laughs> agent also just had yeah. twin babies, uh, and when your agent has twin babies, like, yay! And also, like, I, she. Gets it's all the time she needs to do things. So like yeah. we're going very gradually in the process because her babies matter more than my book does. There you go. Right that kind of works. So. Rightfully so. So is there any other ways, like any websites or any other ways that people can learn more about you? I'm of social media, mostly on Instagram these days. Uh, and mostly for fun. E Nagoski. E-N is a noodle. A-G-O-S-K-I. 
Awesome. We'll also link it in our show notes. <laughs> yeah. I will say that my sister, the the twin sister with whom I wrote it, mm-hmm. um, is has begun a YouTube series called uh, Autistic Burnout. Burnout, mm. burnout for autistic people because we're autistic. And it turns out there's a very specific thing of overwhelm and exhaustion for autistic people. And uh, there are no resources that are evidence-based specifically wow. for autistic folks. So uh, if you want to see what our looks like as applies to neurodivergent folks, find a on YouTube. As a musician, she sings songs very frequently. She's the much more entertaining twin of the two of us. So, <laughs> What is her YouTube so people can find it? It is Autistic Burnout. Oh, that's what it's called? Am- Amelia NP is the username. Uh, Amelia Nagoski P. Amelia NP. And it, like, it's just, it's her like side project that she started for the pandemic because she realized there's a lot of demand for information about autistic burnout and none of it is evidence-based and we've got a book that's written by two autistic ladies awesome well i'm sure that will come very much at handy for many people so thank you for sharing all the ways that people can get in touch with you thank you for just you. changing sex education for us finally yeah. after, <laughs> after <laughs> that so many yeah. so much time of you know growing up false information thank you so much for finally just disrupting what we've been learning and being like hold up hey. <laughs> come on guys let's get our shit together you're yeah. uh you are such a hero. What if everything honestly. you thought was true wasn't true? Yay. <laughs> I'm so glad that's, I would never have expected when I was writing Come As You Are and, you know, destroying my own sex life, not permanently, that it would have the kind of impact that it's had. It's, it's hard to even understand what a positive impact it's had on people's lives. And so thank you for telling me because it's like, I can look back on that and be like, that was worth it. It oh, worked. So worth Yay. it. So worth it. Everybody can, everyone deserves to have better sex. And you yes. are doing that for us. So thank you for for making the world a more healthier sexual place, if that's the way <laughs> to think about it. Uh, we're going to wrap up this episode. Thank you again, Emily, for being a part of the show. And thank you to our listeners for, for listening to this episode, but also go out and get the book, both of those books. They're going to be so life-changing for you. And after you listen to this episode, feel free to give us five stars in Apple Podcast Reviews <laughs> because... Five stars is like the biggest orgasm that we could have. That's like you giving (laughs) us the hottest (laughs) orgasm in the world by giving us five stars. So I'm just saying like, do that shit because it will blow our minds. Um, I think it's an exciter, right? When you oh, it's a the biggest essay, exactly. biggest essay out there. It's a five star <laughs> review. You don't want to like give an example of the, of the sound you make when you get a five star review. <laughs> <laughs> I no pressure. I mean that. It changes from partner to partner. <laughs> it changes. It, it change, every review is different. Every review yes, is different. Absolutely. The last one, the last five star review we got, I think I made a sound similar to like, oh, something like that. But you know, I can't guarantee I can replicate that for the next one. This is like a new, this is like a new program we have. Is like you do yes. a review and you get a video recording back of, of UA orgasm. <laughs> Some of them are like how, some of them are squeaks, some of them are like guttural shudders. Sure. <laughs> yes. And some of them just pure silence. I'm just speechless. Right? It's just <laughs> like breath holding. Yes. But it's all normal. It's all, all normal. normal. It's all that's, good. that's the it's main takeaway good. here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to wrap up this episode. Stay Dateable! The Dateable Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Want to continue the conversation? First, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter with the handle at Dateable Podcast. Tag us in any post with the hashtag stay dateable and trust us, we look at all of those posts. Then head over to our website, datablepodcast.com. There you'll find all the episodes as well as articles, videos, and our coaching service with vetted industry experts. You can also find our premium Y series where we dissect, analyze, and offer solutions to some of the most common dating conundrums. We're also downloadable for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Overcast, Stitcher Radio, and other podcast platforms. Your feedback is valuable to us, so don't forget to leave us a review. And most importantly, remember to stay dateable. There are so many reasons not to skip breakfast. So many savory, mouth-watering, tasty, delicious beyond all belief reasons. 
Actually, that last one was pretty convincing. Stop by for a McDonald's breakfast. Mix and match a sausage biscuit, sausage McMuffin, sausage burrito, or hash browns. Any two for just two bucks. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with combo meal. Back to school season is here and summer is still going strong. Visit Wetco to protect your car's paint from bugs and damage caused by UV rays. Ceramic wax keeps it shiny. If you're a teacher, student, or school staff, we'll give you 50% off a car wash between now and September 11th. Just show your school ID in store or sign up for unlimited washes and cram in all the washes you want for one monthly price starting at $14.99 per month. Go back to school at your brightest. Visit getgocafe.com slash unlimited today.